अब हम कार्यक्रम में प्रेजेंटेशन गेस्ट लेक्चर दिन आने भाग ओलाफ ग्रंस थ्रम हो गैप माइंडर फाउंडेशन आल द वे फ्रम स्वीडन प्लीज टेक द स्टेज थैंक यू थैंक यू एंड आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू बी हेयर टू हेव द अपर्चुनिटी टू स्पीक अबाउट द नीड फॉर टू हेव अ फैक्ट बेस्ड वर्ल्ड व्यू to have a world view that is based on facts and not only about on, on opinions and i am here representing gapminder and gapminder is a swedish foundation so we are not political religious in any way and gapminder was founded by professor hans rosling or the idea for gapminder started when uh, hans taught uh, at karolinska university in stockholm and he was teaching fu uh, future doctors and he was what can i teach them what do i know that these doctors don't know and Pro hans is a professor of global health and uh, he, he he thought that i should ask them some questions before i start teaching so he asked them questions about the world questions that he thought were pretty easy six questions is life expectancy longer in this country or in this country and when the student had answered the question hans was very surprised and kind of sad because they had like one out of six questions right so he he went and asked his colleagues other professors at karolinska uh, universitetet university and they were better they had 2.9 questions right out of six but remember these questions only had two alternatives So by random you should have three right. So Hans did a lecture where he started to compare that does chimpanzee know more about the world than we humans do? And because if if you let the chimpanzee choose between A and B it's just going to be random. Chimpanzee don't know anything about the world but it's scary when random knows more about life expectancy of the world of different countries of the world than medical doctors and professors of health so then hans together with his son ola rosling and ola's wife anna rosling founded gapminder and gapminder has been working for over 10 years to help people develop a fact based world view to get today we're about 10 people working at gapminder me olof fernanda a colleague of mine and we do lectures we provide tools we create stories data stories about the world so pe people can develop a better fact based story about the world but i will do as hans did i will start asking a couple of questions you all should have most of you have a little box on your seats where you can vote on on this question in the last 20 years the proportion of people in the world living in extreme poverty a almost half b remain the same or c almost double do you vote a b and c it's totally anonymous nobody can track who votes who, uh, what and it's the last time so you can actually change you can press a b and c and then it's the last time you uh, press that it's the one that is counting how does the voting look like? We have had 75 responses so far. So I'm going to wait a little bit more before I close this polling. Come on, people, vote, vote, vote. The sooner you press that, the sooner we're out of here. So press it, press it. Okay, so 106, a little bit more, a little bit more. Let's do. All right. Yeah. Oh, it's still coming, still coming. People are still voting. Come on, this is fast. Just answer fast the th first it's thing that comes to your mind. It's only three alternatives. It's easy. Perfect. 130 yes. answers. Closing the polling now. And the right answer is A. The proportion of people living in extreme poverty in the world has actually halved the last 20 years. And at Gapminder, we ask these questions to, uh, uh, to the people in different countries, a representative sample. We all ask it at conferences like this. We ask these questions at the first UN, United Nations World Data Forum. 
We have asked it at World Economic Forum in Davos. And people generally answer like this. This is what my country answered. In Sweden, only 25% know the right answer. Only 25%, less than a third, actually know that poverty has decreased the last 20 years. This is good news. How can we miss so good news? And we ask it in a lot of countries. And most of the time, people don't know this. And then we kind of went to the zoo and asked the chimpanzee. And they beat all the countries that we have asked this question in. And this is scary. It doesn't get, even when we ask this to policymakers or politicians, they don't seem to know these things. And now, how did it go for you? Well, I'm very impressed. It seems that you really are data people because you answered very well. Better, way better than the chimps and all these other countries, definitely. 57% got the right answer. That deserves an applause, I think. Impressive. That was an easy question, I think. And another question that is important. How did the number of death, now it's not the proportion, now it's the number of death per year from natural disasters changed over the last 100 years. So has the people dying from, num uh, from natural disasters the, over the last 100 years, has it, is it less than half? Has it remained the same? Or has it almost doubled? So you can vote again, A, B, and C. Wonderful, they're talking to each other to no, find that's out scary. the answer. <laughs> All right, come on, vote, vote, vote. Let's finish this one too. Oh, come on, we have 115 answers. Give me 10 more. 10 more. Okay, I'm gonna finish in 125. A little bit more, a little bit more. Okay, closing this now. <gasps> and the right answer is the number of deaths from natural disasters has, is less than half today. And this might seem like a Silly question, but this actually represents that we have built societies in many parts of the world that can protect us from nature. We have built societies that can, when there is poverty and uh, when there is famine because of a, uh, of a drought, we can move food there. When there is a storm, we, can, we know the storm is coming. We can prepare people for it. We can prepare for natural disasters, and we can protect ourselves from nature in a way we have never done before. And in Sweden, only 15% knew that. And Sweden is one of the safest countries in the world, so it's kind of amazing that we don't know this. And it's about the same. The trend is the same. We don't know the facts about global macro trends as people not dying from natural disasters. It's not about the lack of data. It's about the lack of data turning into public knowledge. And here, yes, the chimpanzee, they beat us all the time. <laughs> they didn't know this one either. <laughs> they did worse than the chimps now. You did worse than the chimps now. Don't worry, a lot of people do too. Only 30% answered correctly. But 30%. Mm. Well, it's less than the chimps. Yes, but it's still good. And more than half of you thought that it had doubled in the last 100 years. Yep. So this is data that exists. If you have a cell phone, access to the internet, you can go out and find this data. But we need to go reach people with the data. And <clears throat> another question. In low-income countries across the world today, how many girls actually finish primary school? Is it 20% for A, 40% or 60%? Come on, no talking, no talking. Just answer the thing that, with the first thing that comes to your mind. What do you think it is? No need to discuss much. I have, oh, that was fast. I already have 120 answers. Beautiful. Okay, leaving for a few seconds more. One, two, three, closing. And today, Actually, 60% of girls get to finish primary school, according to the World Bank and UNICEF. We at Gapminder, we don't produce our own data. 
We go and find the best data available. It's not perfect. It doesn't tell perfect stories, but it's the best data available. So this is data from UNICEF and the World Bank. And today, 60% of girls in the world finish primary school. Four years of schooling, they learn how to read, write, and do math. And in Sweden, nobody seemed to know this. And it's kind of sad, it's such a success story. Girls getting to go to school. And it's the same trend everywhere. And the chimpanzee, yes, they beat us again. It's a trend. But how did you answer? Well, I knew the answer, but they answered, they were better than the chimps. 37% knew the right answer. Seven. That is 37. 37. Yes. You beat the chimps, very it's good. It's still one of the best answers we have had on this question. Yes. Because we ask these questions, questions like this, we put together a test about the world. How does it go, when it, how, how is the global macro term when it comes to education, reduction in poverty, when, when it, uh, death from natural disasters. We have 12 questions, and we have asked them to 12,000 people in 12 different countries. And you would hope that people would know this th these things, but 15% had zero right. And that's kind of hard to do on 12 questions, where four right alternatives are A, four are B, and four are C. But 15% actually got zero right. And most had one, two, three right. One had 11 right. Out of 12,000, nobody knew all the answers. It is actually that most, more people answered zero right than five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 put together. So there is a lack of knowledge about the world. There is a lack of turning the public data that exists about the world into public knowledge. And that is what we at Gapminder is doing. <laughs> Only 10% were better than monkeys. So what is it that we have missed? And I'm going to try and show you some data. And Basically, this shows the health and wealth of the world. It shows life expectancy on the horizontal axis and income, GDP per capita on the vertical axis. Each bubble represents a country. The color of the bubble shows where in the world the country lies, and the size of the bubble shows the population. And in the beginning of the uh, 19th century, we were all down here in the poor and sick corner. And nothing much happens in the beginning. That's mostly because we don't have data for that time. We only have data for European, some of the European countries. But we see that the world is developing. We see that countries get richer and life expectancy starts. And yes, we have the world wars, which hurt both life expectancy and uh, wealth. But we see that all countries are developing. All countries are becoming richer. All countries in the world are becoming more healthy. And we can see on the journey that the Nepal has made. You started here. The scientists think that the life expectancy and wealth of Nepal were there in the sick and uh, poor corner with everybody else. Now we are here. Now the life expectancy of Nepal is closer to 70. It's like the world average. And you can see that nobody is down here where we started. We started with a life expectancy of around 40, 200 years ago, and nobody is there. Today, the life expectancy is around 70, and most countries are in the middle. Most countries that has a huge population are here, not among the poor of the world. Yes, you can see the differences has increased, but the, which is very important to know, but it's still, it's, it's as, as important to know that every country has become richer and healthier. So this is what people have missed. And behind the visualization you, you just saw, there are 144,000 data points and people don't want to learn them. And uh, we at Gapminer has been working for many, many years to try to explain how the world has developed. And we kind of figured out after a long time, it's not about the lack of facts. It's about feelings. We have 
misconceptions, feelings about the world that, that, that hides the facts from us. Even if we present correct facts, we should, wouldn't see them. What we figured out is that we have three huge misconceptions about, about the world, three mega misconceptions about the world. That the world is divided in two, in rich and poor. That the world is just getting worse. And the population just keeps growing. And these are easy feelings to have. And most people seem to suffer from them. But they are not entirely true. Because, yes, it, some things are getting worse. And I'm not saying everything is getting better. I, don't hope, I hope that nobody's going from here and saying, oh, he showed a lot of graphs where the world, the world is improving. That is not what I'm saying. But I'm saying there are improvements. Things, some things are becoming better. And it's important to see both the improvements and the, things that, the challenges that we still have. For example, if we look at child mortality, which is a good indicator about the healthcare of, of, of a society, we can see that in the beginning, in the 1960s, child mortality in Nepal was quite high. 300 children, according to the World Bank and UNICEF, died before the age of five out of 1,000 born. In India, it was 250. In Malaysia, it was closer to 100. And as time moves on, we will add more countries. China, and you see Nepal is overtaking India, Nepal is overtaking the world average. And today, Nepal is here. You have moved from here, I can't even reach it, down to here. Child mortality is on an all-time low. And this is a trend that is going on in all, all of the world. Especially in Nepal when it comes to child mortality. You are below the world average, you are below India, you are above... above the index of the least developed countries. So things are improving. I'm not saying everything is improving, but some important things are getting better. Another thing that is improving is the access to improved water. This is not clean water. This is improved water. This is water that doesn't make you sick. And if you look, and we only have uh, data from the 1990s here, and if you look in the 1990s, in the least developed countries, around 50% had access to improved water. In Nepal, it was a bit higher, 65%. China, about the same. India, 70 The world average was closer to 75 And as things develop, we see that Nepal is on the rise. You're overtaking the world. And the world average today, when it comes to access to improved water, is slightly over 90%. About the same as in, as in Nepal. But we see that in some countries, are lagging behind. In the, the average for the least developed nations in the world today, by the UN definitions, only 70% have access to uh, improved water. So their, their problem still exists. Exists. And undernourishment, how many people are, you could say, don't have enough food? And in the beginning of the 90s, over 40% of people in the, in the least developed countries, the index for the least developed countries, didn't have access to enough food. Around 20% in China, India, and the world average was about 20%. And as time goes, you can see that in all over the world, we are getting better access to food. We are not suffering from undernourishment in the same way as before. Today, Nepal is here among China and the world, uh, world, world average. India is here. The, the index for the least developed nations are at 25. Today, actually, more people suffer from having too much to eat than having too little. More people die from overeating too much than starvation. It's still too many that lack access to food. But it's improvement. And it's improving. And here comes and a lot of other speakers are speaking about the need to learn from data. 
Why is starvation decreasing? In which countries? In which areas? How can we learn from the success stories to apply them to the problem areas there uh, where we still have problems with undernourishment? I hope you understand my English. It's not the best. Uh, do, any, do, do you know, I come from Sweden, do you know where Sweden uh, exists in the world? In Sweden we actually speak the most common language in the world. Broken English. Spoken by most people in the world. So, if, if, I, if I'm unclear, you can just say it and I will try to improve my English. And at least try to explain it in a better way. Something that is, I think is very, very important is education. And literacy is a good indicator of the quality of the education in the society. And we don't have as good data for literacy as we, for example, have for child mortality. But you can see that 2001, around somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the people in Nepal were literate. And uh, Nepal was around the other least developed countries in the world. But you can also see, as time moves forward, more people are becoming literate in Nepal. There is a positive trend. And if we actually remove Nepal, because we don't have data for Nepal after 2011, you can see that in most countries, the positive trend continues. And if you would look at literacy among the young people, it's much higher. This is the population average to people above 15. So, in the future, hopefully, these figures will improve a lot. So, there are a lot of improvements in the world that we don't see. It's not because we lack the data, it's because we don't see the data. We don't use the data. We don't use the data to find areas where there are still challenges. And the other big misconception we had was that the world was divided in two. That the world was divided in rich and poor. This is a very easy feeling to have. And it's not completely true because, as you saw, most countries on the bubble chart were in the middle. Most countries are what you could consider on a global middle income when you, when you look at the BNP, uh, BNP per capita. But BNP per capita doesn't say everything. You have to look at the income distribution in, inside a country. And even if you look at that, most people today are in the middle. This uh, graph shows the world population in the year 1800. The number of, the size of the mountain is the world population. The, these are different countries and the colors shows where in the world they are located. And I tried to highlight Nepal, but Nepal's population compared to the global population is quite small, so it's kind of hard to see there. But it will become more clear. And you can see that most people were actually kind of poor in the beginning of the 19th century. Most people were living below the extreme poverty line. Most people suffered from a poverty that meant that they didn't have access to enough calories to make sure that they survived. So, Historically, you could say that, no, we weren't divided in rich and poor. Most people were poor, and only very few people were actually rich. And I'm going to fast forward this, because otherwise it will take way too long to see the world develop, because not much happened in the first 100 years. But if you go to the year 1900, mm -hmm. you can see that still the majority of the world population lives b b below the extreme poverty line. Only in Europe has the ma uh, majority of the world population moved beyond the extreme poverty line. And it's still, a lot of Europe is still suffering from poverty. But we see that in Asia and in Africa and in America, people are still suffering from extreme poverty. And if we let this play out, let history play out, we will see that population continues to increase. But we also see that most people are moving out of extreme poverty despite the world wars. And back in the 50s and 60s, then we had the two-humped camel. Then we had, had the divider world. Then we had, had a world of rich and poor. And now, the majority of the world is actually above the extreme poverty line. The majority of the world 
is, is not living in extreme poverty anymore. Like the question we, I asked in the beginning. Extreme poverty has actually halved the last 20 years. So uh, Nepal is supposed to be here, but it's very hard to see. So we will look at how Nepal's GNI has developed the last 30 years. And you have Nepal and the least developed countries down here by the UN index, and you have the world average there. So you see, you see a trend that I show, when I showed shine mortality, improved access to improved water, literacy, Nepal was scoring, had, had scoring way above the world average. Child mortality was low. Child mortality in Nepal is actually like Belgium in the 50s. But economic development hasn't increased in the same way. And it's, it's hard to see the difference between Nepal and the least developed index. If I zoom in and take out the world, you will see at, that Nepal and the countries that are considered to be the least uh, on the UN least developed list are actually developing their economies in about the same speed. And they are lagging behind the rest of the world. So Nepal is, is an amazing country because you developed healthcare, you developed education without much money. And that, I think, is a great achievement. You have a society where people survive, but you have not developed your uh, economic in, uh, economy in the same way yet. But that only leaves you with opportunities. So these are, what I've shown, are different ways of fighting these misconceptions that the world is divided in two, and that, that the world is only getting worse. The last misconception is population is just growing. And this is easy to feel because population has grown rapidly the last years. But it's not completely true because if you take out just, it's more correct because population is growing, but it's also started to balance itself out. But this is kind of hard to see when you look at the world and, when, and, and you see the population trend on the world. Because if you go back 10,000 years in history, we had just become, farm, uh, we had, we had just become farmers, we had left the hunter-gatherer society. We were about 10 million people on the world, as Sweden is today. And then population started to develop. And 8,000 years, it was up to 250 million people. It's an increase, it's not super fast. And then another 800 years, and we were 1 billion. Now something starts to happen. In 100, 130 years, we double Earth population. We're up to 2 billion people. Then it only takes 30 years to add another billion. 14 years for, for another billion. 13 years for the next billion. And in the year 2011, we were 7 billion people on the planet. Today, the UN experts calculate that we are 7.5 billion people on Earth. So population has been increasing rapidly, but it's starting to balance itself out. And that is big, basically because one of the biggest changes in our time is happening right before our eyes. And I'm going to try and show that. This is the same bubbles. The bubbles represent the country. You can see Nepal up there. And this horizontal axis shows child mortality, and the vertical axis shows babies per woman. And in the year 1800, it didn't matter that much where you were born on, uh, on the planet. M around half the children died before the age of five. And most women had four, five, six babies per woman. But at the, at the same time, when we were developed our societies, and you remember that life expectancy has gone from 40 to 70 years in most countries of the world. That is mostly because child mortality has decreased. You can see that child mortality is starting to decrease in, in the European countries, in USA and Canada, and then some of the Asian countries are following it. But at the same time, the babies per woman are decreasing. It just takes a generation from child mortality to go, to go down. Then the number of children starts to go down. Now the Asian countries 
You can see Nepal like a rocket coming down here. And, 2000, and the year 2015, in most countries, children survive. We have gone from half of the children being born, dying before the age of five, to today, most children actually survive. And in most countries, we have around two children per woman. This is the, one of the biggest changes that's, that has happened. But, but, but can, because can you imagine if we continued to have six babies per woman? Then we would have a real problem with overpopulation. But the population for, uh, experts at the UN, they actually predict that in the African countries, they will follow the same trend as the other countries, like the European countries, like the American countries, like the Asian countries. And we will even out in the year 2100 with about two children per woman. Today it's 2.5 children per woman, roughly. But still, population will continue to increase. And we think population will continue to increase to 10, 11. Most experts actually say there will be 11 billion people on Earth in 80 years or so. That is the forecast. And that's not because we have more children, as you saw, because it's decreasing in all over the world. It's actually not because we're li living longer life. Yes, life expectancy is going up, but that is mainly because child mortality is going down. So it's kind of hard to understand why we will be so many more people, 3.5 billion people more, without us actually having more children or living longer lives. And I will try to explain that, but then I will need some help from people in the audience. So could some people, could you come up? <laughs> yes, the, 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 two, the first row here, <laughs> come up on the, on the stage and help me explain. And the people I asked back there, can you come up on stage also? This way is safer, there are a lot of cables that you will fall over. And you too will uh, represent the people in the world that are between, one, uh, between zero and 15 years old. So you will stand here, if it's okay if I move you around, I've done that with a lot of people. And you are between zero and 15 years old, very young people. And there are a lot of them in the world today. <laughs> Two billion people in the world today are between zero and 15. And you are 15 to 30, so you stand just before them, like that. And you are also between 15 and 30. So there are four, you stand in front here, so you create a nice demogra demographic flow. Uh, there are four billion people in the world that are between zero and 30. You are between 30 and 45. There's only one billion there. And you are old. So you will, okay. So it becomes easier to this. And you are between 45 and 60. You stand in front of him. <laughs> and who, you look really old. You're 60 plus. You have to stand in front of him because you're not the same age. So you stand in front of him here. So this is a rough representation of the demographics of the world. We are a lot of young people on the world and a few older. So four, million, four billion are, with, are below 30 and three billion are above, above 30. Then the sad thing happens and you die. So you can go back and sit down. <laughs> and the rest of you become 15 years older, a generation. So you can take a step forward, everybody. Just take a step forward, everybody. Forward, forward, you got the older. And then you two get born. <laughs> and you stay. So now we have 8 billion people in the world. Without us getting older, we only have 1 billion that is 60 plus. And only have 2 billion children. Somebody's filling up her. We are becoming middle age. And then you also sadly die. <laughs> but you can and then you two are born and everybody takes a step forward. So now, we are 9 billion people in the world without us living longer lives or having more children. And then I will need you also to come up, because then you die. <laughs> yeah. And then... 
we are 10 billion people in the world. So actually, you can come back <laughs> because you get saved by modern science. Because you can, you are in front of you are the really, really old one. <laughs> yes. So we will become 11 billion. And only 1 billion will be added because we will have a longer life because of science and better food. And no more will be added because we have more children. Most will be added because there will be more people that are middle-aged. So this is really hard to stop. The population growth is very, very hard to stop. We have to accept it and plan for it. Because this is a fact. The population will grow. Thank you. I think you all deserve an applause. So, the world population had a balance in year, for 200 years ago. Then, every woman gave birth to roughly six children. Four of them died, historically, before the age of five. So there was a balance. Population didn't increase that much. Then something happened. We got access to better food. We got access to better health care. We stopped killing each other in the same way. And we, got, we managed to protect ourselves from nature. And children started to survive. That is the cause of the population explosion that somebody, uh, some people are, are talking about. But we are reaching a new balance. And that new balance is because we choose to have fewer children, like you do in Nepal. Nepal is about average when it comes to number of children per woman in the world today. We choose to have, uh, to have fewer uh, babies. We choose because we have access to the contraceptives, sometimes family planning. We choose because we want to give our children the best opportunities. We want to be able to study for ourselves. So we had a balance of death because children died. And now we have a balance of love because we love our children. And I think that's a better balance. So this is different ways of explaining pretty hard things like demographics. But as you remember that we started the show, we don't see these facts because we have a very, very skewed worldview. And I'm going to try to speak very fast about why our worldview is as skewed as it is for most people. And it depends on what we see and how we think mostly, not, the access, not always access to data. Because when we look at media, when we look at internet, when we look at either old media or new media or even alternative media, we see a lot of disasters. But we don't see when societies manage to build themselves up to protect themselves from disasters. We see pictures of war and conflict, but we don't see that most girls today, over 90% of the girls today in the world actually finish primary school. At, and this has increased at the same time as population has increased. So we don't see the hundreds of thousands of schools that must have been built in the world. And the training of teachers, those we don't see. We see diseases. We see Ebola and horrible diseases. We don't see that eight, over 80% of children today get access to vaccination. We don't see that most people today have access to basic health care, like, for example, vaccination. And then we see refugees. Does anybody know how many refugees there are in the world today? Anybody has a guess? I can't see you because I have very strong lamps. So somebody just guess. The most estimates are that there are 65 million refugees in the world today. And I don't want to belittle their experience because it's horrid. To be, to, be, to be forced from your home, either from conflict or natural disaster. And their tales are certainly important to be heard. But we should all also look that we are 7.5 billion people in the world. 65 million, 7.5 billion people. A billion is a thousand million. Less than 1% are considered to be refugees in the world today. So... And we don't see the proportions as often. And then we go 
and try to see the world through maybe watching documentaries or, or reading books or just watching the newspaper. I, uh, I was at the conference in uh, South Africa a couple of months ago in Cape Town. I have a, a five-year-old uh, son at home and I wanted him to see what Africa was before I, before I left because I was going to be away for uh, almost a week. And we started to watch a documentary about Africa, a BBC documentary about Africa. And it was beautiful because there were pictures of savannas and, and animals and jungles and steppes and everything. And after a while, my son asked, Daddy, aren't there any people in Africa? <laughs> and then we had seen one guy. Uh, yes, he was human. It was a white, very old guy, he, David Attenborough, flying around in a helicopter and watching the animals. Because we don't see the other things in the world. It's very hard to see them because if we are not seeing nature, we are seeing, often seeing problems. We hear about problems. If you, if you watch a documentary about Africa that is about society, it will usually be about the problems in Africa, not about the progress. And then maybe we go on vacation. And then we don't see the world either, usually, because we only see the things in, in, in a certain way. In a, almost we go to some paradises. And then when we look at other cultures, we have a tendency to look at them when they are at the cultural peak. Uh, this picture is not that good. Uh, it can, might be hard to see, but the, this is... In, from Sweden, and this is a maypole. Uh, it's actually a very large phallus symbol that we Swedes dance around imitating frogs one time per year. And uh, th this is called Midsummer Eve. And a lot of pictures from Sweden are, about, are from this celebration. And this is not typical for Sweden. We should show, focus more on showing how ordinary people live their lives, how regular life actually looks like, not when we Swedes, showing a picture of us Swedes having some kind of cultural peak that we don't know what it's about anymore. All these very, very dramatic images we see tend to pile up. And you, yes, you can blame media and say, oh, media gives us a skewed worldview. Uh, I don't think you should only blame the media. Media has a responsibility. But you should all also look to yourself. Why do we choose these stories? Why do we choose to see these stories? Why do we choose to tell these stories? And then we have to look at our brain. Because you, you remember I said that we were about 10 million people when we were hunter-gatherers? And we have evolved so far from that time. We have become 7.5 billion. We have developed our societies to protect us from nature. Children are not dying anymore in the same way. We don't kill each other. But our brain has actually not evolved as fast. Our brain is still, in many ways, the hunter-gatherer brain with two ways of thinking. We have a hot thinking and a cold thinking. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, who is a researcher, uh, an economic researcher that looks into our, how we decide, our decision making says that we have instinctive thinking and, it, and most of our decisions are made based on instinct because it's easier for us to think that way because we were evolved to think very fast. If you are a hunter-gatherer and, and, there, and there, it comes a dangerous animal, you have to react very fast. You can't say, like, hmm, do I have facts? If that animal is dangerous, or can I maybe think myself out of this? You have to react, flee, flee, flee or fight. But today, we should focus more on our slow thinking. We should focus more on looking at the facts, validate our ideas in much greater way, because that will serve us much better in the society we have built today. We should also look into ourselves and not only blame the media, and because There are a lot of facts out there. All the facts that I have presented that most people don't know, they come from open data sources. There are no, nothing secret about them. So 
We have the latest fact from the uh, UNICEF. We have the latest fact from UN, from World Bank, from the Nepalese Bureau of Statistics. We have the latest facts from Gapminder. But we tend to see other things, things that attract our attention, that are dramatic. We might see a murderer, a story about murders. We might see a story about a horrible disease called Ebola. Or we might see uh, yeah, something that we think is dramatic. And all these images, because we choose them, they pile up and create a very dramatic worldview. So having a fact-based worldview is not only about access to facts. It's also about uh, actually taking the time and choose the right facts. Because... We, 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 we at Gapmind, we say that we should develop, develop a habit that we call factfulness. And factfulness is about taking the time to base our decision about facts. And also be humble and say, no, I don't know. Because most of the time, we don't have facts. But we tend to make a decision anyway. But most of the time, we can actually just step, take a step back and say, yeah, I will go and validate that, uh, uh, that idea, or I will go and look it up for you. So factfulness is, is about taking the time of finding the facts. And our brain, I will speak very falsely, even faster than I'm doing now, our brain has hundreds of ways of tricking us. Some are very primal, like fear. Being afraid is as natural as being hungry. But when we are afraid, our blood starts to run to our core uh, musculature, like the legs and the, uh, and the abdomen, and we get ready to fight or flee. But today, we shouldn't be as afraid anymore, because society has evolved. But we are. Our, our instinctive mind reacts. We should think, is, is this really dangerous? And try to control our fear. Or we have a tendency to uh, generalize and not see the positive news. We might read a newspaper article about Boko Haram, a horrible organization <coughs> in Nigeria that, for one, don't let girls go to school. Or Malala, a girl that was abused for wanting an education. And then we can, might read about Malala again. But these three very important stories actually don't say anything about the trend. There are negative news that attract our attention, but it doesn't say anything about the trend of girls' access to education in the world today. And we also have a tendency to divide everything we do in two. We divide the world in rich and poor. We see the rich and poor. It's easiest to see news about uh, refugees and, or news about uh, Kardashians. So, we divide the world in two, and we have hundreds of these ways that our brain is tricking us. And we at Gapminder, we like to simplify things. So we have simplified it into ten dramatic instincts that our brain has that tricks us when it comes to our worldview. And also provided us with some kind of some commandments or uh, advices how you should uh, think instead. You shouldn't think that that's destiny. You should notice the slow changes. And how should we create this fact-based worldview? Should we look at this, the data tables? This is a very small data table. There's nothing, almost nothing in it. This is actually what we don't see. This is the problem, because we don't see these data tables. We see this. We see the dramatic images, the dramatic stories. So what we at Gapminder is trying to do is trying to create a way of, for us to see these facts that we don't see. Tell these 144,000 data points in a very easy visualized way. Or even to delve even deeper down to it and tell the stories about how people actually live. And for that we have a tool called Dollar Street that my colleague Fernanda will present to you.